There is nothing, there is nothing accidental about the death of Jesus. There was nothing accidental about it. His death was not an event that arose in his life that required God to come up with a plan B. His death was plan A. In fact, the Apostle Peter writing in his epistle, in 1 Peter chapter 1, after referring to Jesus as the Lamb of God, listen to what he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, speaking of Jesus as the Lamb of God, he says, For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. But he has appeared in these last times for the sake of you. Who's you? The believer. Verse 21, who through him as our believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. You catch what he's saying there. He says, Jesus, as the Lamb of God, he was foreknown before the foundation as the Lamb of God. What does that mean? In eternity past, Jesus was foreknown by the Father as the one who would come and who would live and who would die on behalf of all who would believe. The death of Jesus was not an accidental event in his life where God had to come up with a plan B. As you read through the scriptures, particularly the Old Testament, you see this affirmed again and again by the prophecies that you find in the scriptures. For example, in Psalm 16, verse 10, you have David writing, and he's writing about his current reality. The fact that his life is in in peril. He, his, his life is being uh, chased, or he's being chased down by, by Saul, and his life is on the brink of extinction. And he writes these words in Psalm 16:10. He says, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. David's saying, You will not allow my life to be taken at this moment. Uh, you will not allow my enemy to conquer me at this moment. You will not cast me down into Sheol at this moment. But this verse right here, verse 10 of Psalm 16, actually points to a historical fulfillment. It's a typology that points to what Jesus would experience in his resurrection. This is a prophecy that pointed to the fact that while Christ would die, he would not undergo decay. He would rise again. Prophecy pointed to the death of Jesus. You got Psalm 22. A Psalm 22 is a, a psalm that refers to the crucifixion of Christ. And it's fascinating because as you look at this psalm, you've got the most minute details being outlined in Psalm 22, hundreds of years before. And then all of us are familiar with what? Isaiah 53, the suffering servant prophecy. And so again, there is nothing accidental about the death of Jesus. His death did not come and take God by surprise where God had to figure out what are we going to do because this wasn't supposed to happen. And it's this reality that comes to the forefront of our text this morning. As Jesus makes known to his disciples at this intimate Passover meal that there is a traitor amongst them. There is a traitor in the camp. But not only is there a traitor amongst them, the traitor is one of them. You see, in our text this morning, you have Jesus with the utmost clarity and confidence exposing the traitor that is in the room. And as he does this, he is continuing to prepare his men for what's about to take place over the next couple of days. And more specifically, what's about to take place in the Garden of Gethsemane in a couple of hours. See, here's the big idea that we're going to really unpack this morning. It's a very simple idea. This text is very straightforward. It's easy to understand, but this is the big idea if you're a note taker to write down. There was nothing accidental about the death of Jesus not even his betrayal. There was nothing accidental about his death, not even his betrayal. So as we work through our time in God's word this morning and we unpack this big idea, we're going to do it by working through verse 18 through 30, and we're going to do it under three simple headings. I'll give them to you very quickly, and then we'll unpack them one by one. We're going to see the prediction, the prediction. Uh, we're going to see the questioning the questioning, and then we're going to see number three, the rejection, the rejection. So let's unpack the heading number one, the prediction, a prediction. Look at verse 18 with me. 
Jesus says, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen. But it is that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heels against me. Now, if we remember what Jesus did last time we studied God's word, it was in the same moment. It was in the same setting, but he had washed his disciples feet and he gave them what? A model for humble and sacrificial and loving service. And then he makes a sharp turn. He gives a sharp contrast, yet an intentional contrast here by saying, in light of what I said in verse 17 about if you obey what I have done for you and you, will, you follow my example, you will be blessed. He says, not all of you will experience that blessing. Not everyone here will experience the blessing of following my example and being a humble servant. And the reason for this is because I am fully aware that there is a traitor in our midst. He was fully aware that one of the 12 whom he had personally chosen was a Benedict Arnold. And what John stresses here, even at the beginning of this section of Scripture, is that Jesus was fully in control. He was fully aware of the situation. He would not be caught off guard. He was not caught off guard by Judas being amongst them. In fact, Jesus intentionally chose Judas to be one of the disciples. John chapter 6, verse 70. Jesus answered them, Did I myself not choose you? The twelve. Notice, not the eleven. The twelve, yet one of you is a devil. Judas Iscariot on the outside looked legit. Judas Iscariot on the outside looked like he was a disciple like every single one of the other disciples were. Judas Iscariot on the outside as he lived amongst the disciples and amongst Jesus looked like he was locked, step, and stride with what Jesus did and what Jesus said and what Jesus promised. But on the inside, in the core of his heart, he was harboring treacherous treason. Treacherous treason. But Jesus, again, he intentionally chose Judas the traitor. And notice the reason why he chose Judas. He chose him so that what? Scripture would be fulfilled. Look at the uppercase letters again that you find in verse 18, which is an indication that this is a quotation of the Old Testament in your Bible. But it was that Scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. It's a quotation of Psalm 41, verse 9, which is referencing more specifically the historical event in David's life in 2 Samuel 16 into chapter 17, where he is betrayed by one of his closest confidants, one of his closest counselors, Ahithophel. As his son is rising in rebellion, Absalom against him, Ahithophel betrays David and his trust. And so Jesus quotes Psalm 41.9, showing a greater fulfillment of this passage. And he says, like a horse kicking its owner, Judas was ready to do harm to Jesus, who was his closest and intimate or close and intimate friend whom he walked with for three years. Now, it's important for us to remember that this is a section where Jesus is doing what? What is he doing for his disciples? He's preparing them. He's preparing them for the events that are about to happen. He's preparing them for what they're going to witness in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's preparing them for the moment where they're going to see Judas on the opposite side of him with a, a group of police that are coming to grab Jesus and to take him. He's preparing them for seeing the whipping and the scourging and the hanging up on a cross. He's preparing them. And he's doing that even now. And he tells us how in verse 19. From now on, I'm telling you before it comes to pass, so that when it does occur, and what does he say? You may believe that I am who? He. Jesus let his men know exactly what his intentions were in disclosing this information to him. When you're studying the Bible, you want to take notice of those phrases so that. By and large, those are what we call hina clauses. They're purpose statements. They clue us in on what's the purpose or what's the reason as to why this is being said or why this is being done. And so we find it right here. He says, so that 
their belief in him, their faith in him, their trust in him, their reliance in him, their following him would be strengthened. As they remember the words of Jesus after the fact, as the Holy Spirit comes, John 14, 26, and aids in bringing everything into remembrance, they would reflect on what Jesus said and they would say he knew it all along. Their confidence in him would be bolstered. Their ministry for him would be emboldened. Their faith would be strengthened. Jesus is preparing them ahead of time. And then look at what happens in verse 20. On the surface level, this seems very disjointed. Look at what Jesus says in verse 20. It seems like he just throws this random remark in there. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him whom or who sent me. Jesus here encourages their hearts and prepares them even more by letting them know that the betrayal of the one who is a traitor amongst their midst that will happen very soon did not thwart the plan and the purposes of God. He is still going to send them out as ambassadors on mission for souls. He says, hey, though this is going to happen, I'm still going to appoint you. I'm still going to send you out like I said I would. He's pointing to the fulfillment of what would happen in John chapter 20, verse 21, when he says, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. My plan and my purposes are not thwarted by what's about to take place place. He was preparing them so that when it happened, they did not drift into complete and utter despair of heart. He was letting them know that everything was on track and according to the sovereign plan of God. Now, as the divine son of God, we, we get the sense that he's fully aware of what's going on, right? He's not surprised by what's going to take place. He's forecasting it. He's promising it. Hey, this is going to come. And so as much as we rest and we see and we acknowledge his sovereignty in this moment, his deity in this moment, John doesn't want us to miss the humanity of Christ as well. Despite the fact that he knew he came to die, despite the fact that he knew betrayal was on the horizon, his heart was still gripped with anguish and heartache and pain in light of what was going to take place. And we see this in verse 21. There's still emotion surrounding this situation. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled, troubled in spirit. And he testified and said, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. The word troubled is a familiar word over the past couple of chapters of John, is it not? Where do we see this word before? John chapter 11, verse 33. Jesus was troubled when Lazarus died. One of his closest friends, he was in anguish of soul and heartache. We see this word in John chapter 12, verse 27, when the hour of the cross had come and we uh, reference the anguish of soul that was in his bosom, was in his heart in light of what was coming. See, in light of the betrayal that was coming and in light of what would happen as a result of that, Jesus was deeply troubled. Let me give you a quote from Leon Morris in reference to this verse. He says, A very human Jesus is described as troubled in spirit here. Though John pictures Jesus as in control of the situation, he does not let us think of him as unmoved by the events through which he was passing. Close quote. Jesus was troubled by the betrayal. He was troubled by the crucifixion coming. He was troubled by the coming separation from the Father as he endured the wrath that you and I were meant to endure. He was troubled. Now understand, just take yourself into the room. Take yourself into the room. Imagine hearing Jesus say these things. You could imagine the temperature is beginning to rise in the room, right? The pressure is beginning to build. What is he talking about? What is he referencing? What is he saying? And we begin to see this reality of this tension And point number two, the questioning. The questioning. This bit of news had to affect the temperature in the room. For Judas, his heart had to be getting faster. His body temperature had to be rising. The Son of God was unmasking him 
as he spoke every single word. But for the disciples, they were astonished. They're trying to figure out what he is referring to, and they begin to question. Verse 22, the disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. As the words of Jesus make their way into their ears, they're trying to wrap their minds around what Jesus had just said. What could he really be referring to? Is one of them really going to betray him? Would this be an accidental betrayal? Uh, Would they give the Son of God up on accident? Or would this be purposeful? Would this be nefarious? Would this be uh, filled with uh, wicked motives? They're trying to figure it out. In fact, we learn in the synoptics that the disciples began to question Jesus if it was them. Matthew chapter 26, verse 21, being deeply grieved, so they're pierced in heart, they begin to each one say to Jesus, surely not I, Lord. They're looking at at Christ saying, is it me? Is it me? Surely not me. And in fact, we learn in Matthew chapter 26, verse 25, Judas even chimes in. He says, surely not I, Rabbi, not me. He had to speak at that moment. He couldn't be the only one quiet at that moment. So yet again, he's masking himself amongst the group and he's hiding in the camp. And eventually in the midst of the general questioning, Peter tries to gain some further clarity. And we begin to see this in verse 23 through verse 25. There was reclining on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples Whom Jesus loved. This is a reference to John, uh, the apostle, the author of this book. It's the first time we've come across this title for himself. We're going to see it a couple more times as we work through the last portion of the Gospel of John. Verse 24, so Simon Peter gestured to him. We don't know if it was just a look. We don't know if it was a nod. We don't know if it was just a locking of the eyes. We don't know if he, he waved his arms to try to get his attention. We don't know, but he gestured to him and said to him, Tell us who it is of whom he is speaking. He, being John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, in verse 23, leaning back thus on Jesus' bosom, said to him, Lord, who is it? Who is it? Now, as I mentioned last week, they would have been reclining at what's called a triclinium. This was a low-to-the-ground table, often that would have mats that would be laid out away from the table, and they would be leaning on their left arm, allowing their right arm to be free to grab food at the table that was in front of them and to be able to drink whatever liquids were in front of them. Their feet would have been cascaded to the back of them. And so when we see that and understand that, it helps us to really make sense of what it means for him to be in the bosom of Christ. You see, we don't know the exact arrangement of the disciples in relation to Jesus, but what we can figure out from the details is, one, Peter was not next to Jesus, because if he was next to Jesus, Peter was never shy, right? Peter was never shy to ask a question. He would have asked Jesus directly. So he funnels the question through John, and then what we learn also from observation is that John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, is likely right to the right of Jesus. He's right next to Jesus. And so we can picture it. Peter's over here, or maybe he's over here. We don't know. Maybe Peter's right next to John. John's right here. He hears Peter's request, and then he leans back, and then he's in in the bosom of Christ. And he whispers the question to Jesus. By the way, this is the reason why the painting by Leonardo da Vinci is not an accurate depiction of the Last Supper. When you look at that, that cannot be how the Last Supper was set up. So John leans into the bosom of, of Jesus, and he asks Jesus the question, who is it? Who is it? And this leads to the final portion of our text this morning from verse 26 through 30, as Jesus gives the answer. And we'll look at this under the heading, the rejection, the rejection. Having asked Jesus who it was, verse 26, Jesus then answered, Jesus then answered, that it is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. You get the sense that this was a private response to John. You get the sense that not everyone in the room 
heard what Jesus said. In fact, in verse 28 and 29, we're going to see this confirmed because they're going to be wondering as to what Jesus was meaning when he told Judas to go out from amongst them. And so having responded to John quietly, Jesus does exactly what he said he would do to point out to John who it was. Verse 26, the second portion. He had dipped the morsel. He took it, that means Jesus, and he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon, Iscariot. Jesus dipped that little piece of bread into the Haraseth Soth, which would have been a staple at Passover time and at Passover feast. And he hands it to Judas, who's maybe even directly on his left. And it was at this time that we learn, verse 27, after the morsel, Satan then entered into him. Therefore, Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. This was an extension of grace. This was an extension to say, hey, think about this. I know where you're at. I know where your heart's at. I know the trouble in your soul right now. I know what you're working through. I know that you're about to betray me. This was the last extension of grace by Christ. Yet in this moment, Judas yields. He gives himself fully to Satan's plan. And to Satan's disposal, Satan enters him and Judas now becomes the direct tool to betray the Son of God. Now it's important for us to remember that while Judas's actions were predetermined, it did not negate his responsibility. While his actions were predetermined that he would be the one who would betray the Son of God and thus he was fulfilling Scripture What you find in scripture is this tension where he is still responsible and he is still fully culpable, not God, for his rejection of the Messiah and his betraying of the Messiah. Now, how can I say that? Well, Luke chapter 22, verse 21 and 22, listen to what it says in Luke chapter 22, verse 21 and 22. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with mine on the table. This is Luke's retelling of the event. And then listen to what he says in verse 22. For indeed, the Son of Man is going to be betrayed as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. He's responsible. He's culpable. This was his decision. This was his heart. And thus, he conjoins himself with Satan at this moment willingly and joyfully. And based upon the lack of response by the disciples in the room, we get the sense that they had no idea what was going on based upon what Jesus tells him to do in verse 28 or verse 27, saying to go out. Look at verse 28. Now no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. Specifically, when Jesus said, what you do, do quickly, they're wondering, why did he say this? Verse 39 or 29. For some were supposing, because Judas had the money box, he was the treasurer of the group, that Jesus was saying to him, buy the things we have need of for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. So the other disciples were apparently wondering, why did Jesus tell Judas to leave? You know, maybe, maybe it was to go buy some things that we needed for, for this Passover feast that we're participating in. Maybe they had run out of things, and so they're, they're looking at empty dishes or something, and they're saying, oh, he just went them to, to send them out. Others were saying, no, he had the money box, so maybe, maybe he's going out to, to, to give to the poor. I mean, it was peculiar that he was leaving at this time. They're trying to wrap their minds around it. Clearly, they don't understand what's going on, and clearly, they don't understand what took place before them. It makes you even begin to wonder, why did John not say anything? I mean, John knew. Why did, why did he say anything? But just imagine you're John right now. Imagine you're, you're at the Passover feast. Your Lord, whom you have followed, your rabbi, your teacher, whom you are trusting to be the Messiah, just said, one of you in the room is going to betray me. You lean in, you get clarity. You learn who it is. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is handing him a morsel. He's sending him out. How astonished and how taken aback would you be where you would just honestly just sit there and observe what's going on? That's why I think John didn't say anything. He's he's being blown away by what he's watching. It's clear that the rest of the disciples who had no idea didn't assume anything negative about Judas. Judas had been amongst them for years and he had covered his tracks well. 
And so they said maybe he went out to buy food or buy something or give to the poor. And then look at verse 30. Judas, after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately. So this is John's description right here. He went out immediately and it was what? Night. It was night. Now we've got to remember the themes in the Gospel of John. You have light and darkness. And those are themes that take on a moral and an ethical reality as you work through the Gospel of John. This isn't just a time marker of the fact that, hey, it was night and the sun was gone. No, it was night theologically speaking in the heart of Judas. It was night. John MacArthur put it this way, not only had darkness descended over Jerusalem, but also over Judas's heart. He was now completely under the sway of the power of darkness. Treacherous treason at this moment was determined and accepted and embraced. Like I said, it's very simple and straightforward text. It's not too much to add into a text like this. And so by way of application, what are some things that you and I should consider this morning having studied verse 18 through 30? Let me just give you two. Two things to consider this morning. Number one, these are both statements. Number one, you will witness people betray Christ in the church. I mean, really just let that settle in real quick. You will witness people betray Christ in the church. I, I don't do this often, but simply look up and look to the left and to the right of you. Really, like just look to the left and to the right of you. Look at brothers and sisters in this room right now. The reality is, there may be some people in here who will defect from Christ. They have been a part of this body for years. They have served. Maybe even they've been on staff. Maybe they've served in different positions within the church. They have taught different classes. They've been life group leaders. One of the things we could never be shocked of, because when we're shocked of it, I didn't mean not heartbroken over, we should always be heartbroken over the fact that people leave out from amongst us, proving themselves not to be of us, meaning believers, but we've got to make sure that we know that this will be a constant reality until the Lord comes back because it's usually when things like this happen, you get movements like deconstructionism in the church. You get heartache and pain when people experience a blow to the gut because somebody they trusted, somebody they confided in, somebody they followed, somebody that was their disciple or showed themselves to not really be legitimate when it comes to following Christ and it just takes the wind out of their sails. You know, if that, if that, that could happen there, I, I don't know if I want anything to do with that. And then you have movements like deconstructionism where people leave the church where they never come back in because they, they feel everyone's hypocritical. See, we just got to remember, we just got to know and we got to be aware of the fact that, hey, at the end of the day, there will be people in this room and people we rub shoulders with who will betray Christ and they will defect from Christ. We just got to know that. We got to weep over that. We got to call brothers and sisters to repentance when that happens. But it will happen. It will happen. And this leads to number two. Number two. And I, 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 I assumed it would get heavier in this moment, but I don't think there's any real way to pull ourselves out of this in light of studying the story of Judas. I don't think anyone willingly goes to preach on Judas, right? Like, who wants to do that? But it's in the scriptures. Number two. Very important. Remember, your heart, your heart is the true indicator of your spiritual condition. Your heart, what's going on inside of you right now, your love for Christ or your lack of love for Christ is the truest indicator of your spiritual condition. Remember, Judas walked the walk. Judas served and lived amongst the Son of God. Like all the other disciples, Judas was in. 
So much so where they didn't suspect anything negative of him until Jesus began to unmask him. Yet his heart was never really with Christ. His heart never was really yielded towards Christ as Savior and as Lord. He wanted the benefits of following Christ. He wanted the prominence of being in the kingdom uh, physically where he would have a a position of power. Uh, He wanted access to the funds that would come with being amongst such kingly royalty. But once he saw all that going away, once Jesus started talking about dying, once Jesus started uh, saying things like, I will not be with you, you could see his excitement and his exuberance that carried him along thus far began to dissipate. When he's with Lazarus and he sees one of Lazarus' sisters pour ointment on his feet, he can't help but think, you know what? That's a waste. That was something I could have pocketed. It's clearly that Jesus doesn't care about setting this kingdom thing up right now. It's clear he doesn't care about prominence. Well, since I'm not going to be a part of that, let me just get as much as I can. And you begin to see his true colors come. His heart was never really with Christ. The heart is the true indicator of your spiritual condition. Brothers and sisters, hear me on that. There are some of you in here right now, whom as I say that, you know your heart is drifting away from Christ. You know it. You know it as I say it right now. Whether it's because you've been hurt, uh, whether it's because of a specific sin you're harboring, uh, whether it's because of a different circumstance in life, you know right now the trajectory of your uh, commitment towards Christ is this way. Not this way, it's this way. You're feeling the hardness take over. You're feeling the hardness creep in. That's a warning sign. That's a warning sign. This is what's happening to Judas right now. The condition of his heart is being stilled at this moment as he yet again rejects grace. That's what the epistle in Hebrews is driving at. It says, don't. Stop short of entering the rest that God gives. Don't stop short. What does your condition of heart say about your relationship with the Lord right now? Just ask yourself that. What does the condition of your heart say about your love for him right now? The heart is the true indicator of your spiritual condition. I can't help but think that John, right here, who's writing with the purpose of showing who Jesus is for the purpose of bringing people to faith, is hoping as he pens this as an agent of the Spirit, I can't help but believe that he's hoping at this moment, and even as he's writing, he's praying at this moment, that I I just hope, I hope those who read about Judas will realize I don't want to be that. I want to be like the other disciples. They failed and they faltered. They were not legitimate all the time, but their heart was really with Christ and that they embraced Christ in light of what they read right here. What does your heart condition say about your spiritual condition with Christ? See, there was nothing accidental about the death of Jesus, not even his betrayal. And as we study the Gospel of John and look at Jesus's unmasking of Judas the betrayer. This should spur us to examination. It should spur uh, spur us to thankfulness if indeed the Lord has awakened our heart to Christ. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to study it this morning. Uh, We thank you for the warnings that we find that are explicit in Scripture as well as implicit in light of the narrative that we studied. And so, Lord, I just simply pray and ask that as I've been praying and thinking through the past couple of days and prep for this sermon, that a text like this would be applied by your spirit to our hearts so that we might examine rightly where we're at with you. That we might embrace examination, knowing that it is a good thing. And having examined and praying like the psalmist, Lord, search me and reveal any wayward way in me. That as we come through that and we are yet again reassured of our hope with you and our our faith that it is real and genuine and our love for you, which is the greatest evidence 
of the fact that we are with you today, as First John highlights, that we would just rejoice and thank you. Yet we also pray. We pray in love. Lord, if there's anyone in here that is far from you, whose heart condition uh, does not match what the outward appearance looks like, whether that's because of a hard season of indwelling sin or whether that's because the heart is yet to be uh, given over to Christ in conversion, we just pray and ask that you would do your work. Thank you for the fact that the power is in your word. The power is in your word to change and to transform us from one degree of glory to the next. And so we simply pray that you would do that for all of us today as you apply your word to our hearts, however uniquely we need it. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We rejoice in the fact that we have been made children of God. It's in Christ's name. Amen.